gifted instructor in this realm of evangelism. So can't wait for him to be here. And he'll be preaching next week as well. So um, he'll be preaching for us on the Lord's Day. Well, with that in mind, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, take them and turn with me to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9, as we continue on in our sermon series that we've entitled Foundations, Genesis 1 through 11. Oh, kids, um, off you go. I forget that every week. I'm sorry, guys. Off you go to your class. God bless you. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 18 Genesis chapter 9 and verse 18, and what we're going to do is we're actually going to look at just verses 18 to 29 in our reading, but we're going to look at the end of chapter 9 and the whole of chapter 10 as we continue on in our study of Genesis. Genesis chapter 9 and verses 18 through to 29. Genesis chapter 9 verses 18 through 29, and as usual, we'll read responsively, so... I will read the even-numbered verses, and I'll invite you to read the odd-numbered verses with me. Genesis chapter 9 from verse 18, and if you're able to do so, would you stand with me out of reverence for God's word? Genesis chapter 9 from verse 18 through to verse 29. Brothers and sisters, these are God's words. Noah's sons who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the, father of, was the father of Canaan. No. These three were Noah's sons, and from them the whole earth was populated. Noah, as a man of the soil, as a man of the soil, began by planting a vineyard. He drank some of the wine, became drunk, and uncovered himself inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a cloak and placed it over both their shoulders, and walking backward, they covered their father's nakedness. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father naked. When Noah awoke from his drinking and learned what his sons, his youngest son, had done to him, he said, Canaan is cursed. He will be the lowest of slaves to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be Yahweh, the God of Shem. Let Canaan be Shem's slave. Let God extend Japheth. Let Japheth dwell in the twins of Shem. Let Canaan be Shem's slave. Now Noah lived 350 years after the flood. So Noah's life lasted 950 years, then he died. Pray that God will bless that reading of his word and grant us understanding. Let's pray, ask for the Spirit's help as we study God's word, and then we'll proceed from there. Heavenly Father, we would ask that as we open up your word, and as you minister to us, your blood-bought people, that you would open our eyes, that we would see wonderful things out of your law. And Father, as we pray that for ourselves, we also pray that for Gold Valley Fellowship up in Gold Hill, pray for Pastor Dave Gomez, who I've gotten to know in the last few weeks, through our Pastors Fellowship, thank you for him and the work you're doing there. Pray for them as they think through some matters of transition as to where you would have them to continue ministry and matters like that. We pray that your spirit would be at work granting clarity, granting help, and above all, helping them to continue to minister to your people as you have called them to do. Be with them, and we pray that you would be with us now as we open up your word. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Please be seated. Well, this afternoon I have tagged our text, God and the Nations, and it's part one of that because really the next few sections of Genesis deal with this theme of God and his relationship to the nations. We're making progress in our study of Genesis 1 through 11. In fact, we've really only got one more message in our study of Genesis 1 through 11, and then we will park the bus on this journey of Genesis for a little bit, and we'll pick up in the fall in chapter 12. As we've been looking at uh, the book of Genesis, and we've been considering what God is doing through his servant Moses as he is giving us really the story of everything. 
as you look at the flood and its aftermath, there's actually a trajectory that you can follow. Um, I should have this up on the screen there. There's a trajectory you can follow that starts with creation and it ends with the flood. You have creation, you have the fall, which happens in chapter 3, you have moral decline that carries all the way through to the beginning of chapter 9 where the flood narrative happens. And so that's the sort of cycle you have. You have creation, you have fall, you have decline, and then you have judgment. Well, when you come to the flood, you see, that should be the next slide up there now, uh, you see again this theme of creation, fall, decline, and judgment, but now the cycle starts over. So after the flood, the world has basically been cleaned off, as it were. We saw from last time that the language that's used is a language of recreation. There was a decreation in the flood, but now there is recreation as the earth is made new. But as we're going to see in our text here today, what you have is not just a recreation, but then you have a fall, you have a decline among men, and that leads to another judgment that we will consider next time when we look at the Tower of Babel. So we're looking at the first of these three elements, recreation, fall, and decline in the text that we're looking at. And as we begin to kind of land the plane of our study of Genesis 1 through 11, once again, Noah's going to be the central character here. And as I noted in our last message, if you remember, Noah is functioning as something of a new Adam, that he is acting in the stead of Adam, who was to be the sort of father of a this race that we would know as the human race, well now, with the flood and all of the previous inhabitants of the earth being destroyed, you now have Noah and his three sons. And Noah in particular is going to function as a new Adam in a new creation. And as we're going to see, despite a new world, a new creation, if you will, brothers and sisters, the more things change, the more they stay the same. In essence, what we're looking at as we can have this in our last message in Genesis in a couple of weeks. Uh, What we're seeing here is really a transition that's taking place. We're transitioning from a focus on events and the global scale, as it were, and now we're starting to focus a little bit more on God's covenant people and the plan of redemption in particular. When we pick up in the fall of chapter 12, in Genesis, the focus, well, at really the beginning of chapter 11, we're going to see that the focus moves from the nations in general to this one line in particular. But for, the, for us to get to that point, the stage needs to be set, and that's what we're going to see here in chapters 9 and 10 this week, and chapter 11 in a few weeks. If we're thinking about this passage in in terms of a big idea, just one thought that summarizes it, you could have it like this. That despite the failure of man, God's global plan of redemption can and will not be thwarted. Despite the failure of man, God's global plan of redemption cannot and will not be thwarted. We're going to see some very, very, very unsavory incidents in our text today. But even in the midst of that, even with the failure of man, the plan of redemption that God has for the entire world cannot and will not be thwarted. For the remainder of our time, I want to consider three demonstrations of the failure of man in our text three demonstrations of the failure of man and how they show even with man's failure God's faithfulness to his promise of redemption yes man messes up and he messes up constantly but God is still faithful to his promise of redemption so three demonstrations of the failure of man and how they show God's faithfulness to his promise of redemption First of all, consider with me the fact that though it's a new world, man still has the same old character. Though it's a new world, man has the same old character, verses 18 through 23 of chapter 9. So our text opens up simple enough. Verse 18, Noah's sons who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. 
Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were Noah's sons, and from them the whole earth was populated. Really what you've got here is a, what we call a topic sentence. It kind of tells you what we're about to consider in the section of text that we're looking at. Noah, three sons, and Noah and his three sons formed the root of this new creation. And like I said, the scene is being set for us. For this transition from an events-based narrative, as we've seen leading up to the fall, leading from that to a personality-driven narrative that we're going to start seeing with Abraham in the beginning of chapter 11. We meet Noah again in verse 20. So verse 20 says, Noah, as a man of the soil, began by planting a vineyard or a vineyard. He drank some of the wine, became drunk, and uncovered himself inside his tent. Now, unless you read this as just a very weird story about Noah getting drunk, which it is a story of Noah getting drunk, and apparently disrobing himself while he's drunk, because let's face it, drunk people don't exactly make great decisions. Unless you read it as just that, for those of you who've been walking through our study of Genesis really from the beginning, Remember how I've said that Genesis is highly compositional in its nature? How that Genesis shows a high level of strategy in how things are said and how things are arranged? I put it to you that these two verses here, verses 20 and 21, is another piece of evidence in favor of the fact that we aren't just reading bare history here. We are reading very well put together history, all true events. He didn't make any of this up. But in the way things are said and the way things are arranged, you're meant to pick up on certain clues. I'm going to argue that as I studied this text this week, it became apparent that these two verses are designed to show a direct link between Noah and Adam once again. Can I I point out just four ways the text does this? So remember back in Genesis God is the one who plants the garden in chapter 2. The exact same word, the exact same form of that word is used for Noah and his act of planting this vineyard. Adam and Eve ate of the fruits of the tree back in Genesis chapter 3. Well, the text goes out of his way to point out that Noah, did you see that there in verse 21? He drank some of the wine that comes from this vineyard. Again, a link being made. Adam and Eve ate of the fruits of the tree, Noah is partaking of the fruit of a tree. Third, Adam and Eve sin as a result of eating the fruit of the tree. So, in Genesis chapter 3, Eve eats of this fruit and gives to her husband, and that's the sin. The sin here is not so much the drinking as much as the being drunk due to partaking from the fruits of this vineyard. Finally, Back in Genesis chapter 3, remember what happens to Adam and Eve as a result of the fact that they partake of this fruit? The text tells us, then they knew they were naked. Eating of this fruit leads to an awareness of nakedness. While Noah partakes of the fruit of the vine and uncovers himself. That's just four of them. I could go on with parallel after parallel between the creation account, particularly the fall account, and Noah. I could go on, but I hope that point was made somewhat. Uh, Though this new world holds so much promise, what's the one thing that stayed the same? Man. Man is still the same. And if Noah is the new Adam, ladies and gentlemen, step right up. This is his fall. Can I pause the note for a moment that oftentimes human beings are tempted to think that A perfect environment is the cure for the problems that man has. But this text teaches us that a perfect environment, think about this, there are no other people around. There is Noah, his three sons, and their wives. Eight people. And even in a perfect environment, no other sinful people around. The problem is not the presence of sinful people. Because as we read our Bible, our Bible makes it clear to us that man's biggest problem is not external, it's not his circumstances, it's not things around him. Man's biggest problem, according to the Bible, is internal. 
Remember what Jesus said in Mark chapter 7? Mark 7, 15, if you're taking notes, he said, nothing that goes into a person from outside can defile him, but what comes out of a person, the things, excuse me, that come out of a person are what defile him. His disciples hear that as good Jewish boys who've been taught from the beginning there's certain things you eat and don't eat. And they're like, Master, what do you mean? So here's Jesus' explanation. He says, don't you realize, Matthew 7, 18, don't you realize that nothing going into a person from the outside can defile him? Your problem is not external things. For it doesn't go into his heart, but into the stomach and is eliminated. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of people's hearts come evil thoughts, sexual immoralities, thefts, murders, adulteries, greed, evil actions, deceit, self-indulgence, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All of these evil things come from within and defile a person. Often we're tempted to think that the problem is out there somewhere. If I can just deal with the thing out there, I'll be fine. But Genesis has already taught us through Adam and Eve and through Noah, in fact, dare I say the history of humanity as a whole proves to us that we have found the problem and it is us. <laughs> and so here you are, you have Adam, who the, Noah, excuse me, you have Noah, who the text tells us is a righteous man. And yet this righteous man is not immune to the presence of sin in a fallen world. Well, sin obviously comes with consequences. May I draw your attention to verse 22? So it says, Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a cloak, placed it over, their both, over both their shoulders, and walking backward, they covered their father's nakedness. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father naked. Now, as with so much of the early chapters of Genesis, there's a lot of in my opinion, unnecessary insistence that the simplicity of what we just read here is hiding something more. One popular theory is that Ham didn't just see, happened to see his father undressed, but that he sexually assaulted either Noah or his own mother. This is actually a very popular theory if you read certain commentaries. Now, the Bible is full of the torrid and the scandalous. I mean, we just read Genesis 34. I mean, sinners will do that. But I'm going to go ahead and say that there's a lot of speculation that is placed on this text that the text cannot support. Here's a good rule for Bible study. This is your own personal Bible study. When it comes to Bible study, the simplest answer is often, not always, but often the closest to the truth. And in this case, I would argue textually, the simplest answer is the one the text gives us. Noah gets drunk, he makes a spectacle of himself, Ham sees it, I mean, have you ever seen a drunk person? Uh, I unfortunately have seen, I, you have to pray for me, they're a group of people I struggle to be nice towards, and I've had to pray, Lord, help me to be more kind-hearted towards drunk people. I've also been hit by drunk people, that's a whole other story for another time, but be that as it may, if you've ever seen a drunk person, they usually don't act like someone who has some sense. And so you can just picture Noah who is drunk out of his mind. His son sees it, thinks it's funny. May I know and say there's a simple lesson that you can learn from that there. Thinking everything is a punchline, waiting to happen doesn't always end well. He thinks it's funny and go tells his brothers. His brothers have a little more common sense and decency and they go to provide a covering for his nakedness. Covering for nakedness after sin. Doesn't that sound familiar? Didn't God do that for Adam and Eve after they sinned? Again, I think it's an, a, an example of the author of Genesis, Moses, wanting us to see that there are connections here. As one writer summarizes it, Ham's sin, quote, was, not, was in not honoring his father by demonstrating discretion and loyalty. Though his father's shame was exposed, he did nothing to respect his father by concealing it from others. This is evident in the contrasting action of Shem and Japheth, of Shem and Japheth, who covered their father's nakedness and took extraordinary measures so that they did not see his nakedness. 
As you read these words, we've moved, remember the end of the last passage, we saw God's covenant with Noah. Well, we've moved from the heights of God's covenant-making activity with Noah, and so soon in the narrative it would seem, the wheels have fallen completely off. You see, the, the world might be washed off and new, but the sinful heart of man remains the same. Because man, even the best of them, man is still corrupted by sin. And you see, brother and sister, the issue is not a bad environment. A bad environment might stir up what is already there, but please note, the sin is already there because that's the biggest issue. It's not a bad environment, but a deeply corrupted and depraved nature that only grace can transform. It's a new world, all right, but the character of man remains the same. But there's a second demonstration of the failure of man in this text. Not only have we seen a new world, but the same old character. Secondly, we have a new world, but the same old consequences. A new world, but the same old consequences. Verses 24 through 29. Now in verses 24 to 29, we have the so-called curse of Canaan. This is Noah's response to the shameful actions of his son. And within this one word of curse, you have three components. Three different groups are addressed. Again, it's very similar to what we read in Genesis 3, where after the fall, remember, God speaks to three different groups. He speaks to the serpent, speaks, well, he speaks to the woman, speaks to the man, speaks to the serpent. Well, you have three groups here again, with one sinful act leading to an address to three different parties. Now, as I was putting this together this week, uh, I borrowed an outline, because it was actually an easy one for me to remember. If I recommended it in the study guide this week, uh, Dr. Warren Risby's very short commentary, Be Basic, on the book of Genesis. He had an easy outline for this section that just stuck with me, so I kept it. He says, first of all, you see the enslavement of Canaan in verses 24 and 25. The enslavement of Canaan, verses 24 and 25. So 24, when Noah awoke from his drinking and learned what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Canaan is cursed. He will be the lowest of slaves to his brothers. Now, let's see who's paying attention. What's wrong with what you just read? Sorry? Ham's not mentioned. Verse 25, he said, Canaan is cursed. Canaan is Noah's grandson, not his son. Wasn't it Ham who sinned? I mean, we just read it. It was Ham. So the question becomes, why does Noah curse his son, or Ham's son, and not his own son? Well, like I said, when we read Genesis, we should not just read this as bare history. It's not just deporting, reporting things excuse me, in a detached way. Remember, this is written to an original audience. This is written to a group of people. Remember my favorite line for them? The children of Israel on the plains of Moab are waiting to go into the wilderness. Well, for that group of people, when they heard the name Canaan, what did they immediately think of? The nations that were around them that they had to dispossess. They were the Canaanite peoples. You see, like I said, Genesis is not just history. It's theologically driven history. It's real events with real people in real time and space. But we're looking at them through the lens of God's action and his revelation to his people. Canaan is mentioned here because now we're getting an explanation for what we're going to see later in the Old Testament when the children of Israel are tasked not just to fight the Canaanites, but to utterly remove them. Let me, let me double back a little bit. When we approach this curse, there are two principles at work here we need to bear in mind. In fact, these two things come up a lot in the Old Testament. The first principle we need to think about is something called corporate personality. Corporate personality, that's just a fancy way of saying that in the ancient world, when one person sinned, their sin reflected on a whole group of people. If I can give you an example from the book of Joshua, and remember the story of Achan? If you don't know the story, Achan steals some property f that was devoted to the Lord when they are raiding one of these cities. Israel is completely defeated in their next battle. Joshua goes before the Lord and says, Lord, what happened? I'm like, we were rolling. What on earth happened? 
and I love that narrative. God basically tells Joshua, Joshua, get up off the ground. Like, please, stop crying and complaining. This is not what needs to happen right now. What happened is somebody sinned against me by taking that which was stolen. Eventually, in God's providence, through the means of guidance that God gave the children of Israel, they find the person. It's Achan. Achan says, yeah, I saw some gold and a really nice bit of fabric, and I took it. Well, the text tells us that it's not just Achan who's killed as a result of that, because that was devoted to the Lord. It's Achan's whole family, his whole house. Everyone attached to him. Why? Because there was this understanding that one person's sin reflected on the family as a whole. Ham sins, and his family feels the effect. But there is another principle at work here, and it's the principle of parental influence. You see, the, the world of the Bible was not quite as individualistic as ours. They understood that one's family often influenced how people acted further down the line you went. Ham demonstrates that he was far from godly and that ungodliness would find its way through his sons to the nations that bore his name. Canaan would ultimately be no better than his father, and that would lead to his ultimate enslavement to his brothers. Now, before I move on, historically there was a view that was taught based on this called the curse of Ham. And the idea was, okay, so you've got this curse that is, you know, levied on Ham's descendants, or Canaan in particular. And the language of slavery in these use, of enslavement, they would be slaves. And so this became an apologetic. And you may think, people genuinely thought this, they did. People thought that this gave biblical warrant for the slave trade. Up until very recently, no, it's not really used in our circles, but in the circle I grew up in, there was a very famous study Bible called the Diggs Annotated Reference Bible. If you were a Pentecostal, which is what I grew up as, the study Bible of study Bibles was the Dake study Bible. And I owned a Dake growing up because I was Pentecostal. You all owned a Dake. Well, technically my dad did, but I had access to one. In Dake's Reference Bible, he wrote that in the 50s. In his notes on Genesis chapter 9, he says that here is the biblical basis for the subjugation of, as he puts it, colored peoples. From this text. And you can read people down through history who use this text to justify the horrors of the slave trade. As you can imagine, I may take that a little personally. But I'm sorry, whoever thought that from this text, I have to ask whether they learned how to read at school. Because the text clearly doesn't say Ham. Yes, Ham is the father of the African peoples. We'll see that in Genesis chapter 10 in a moment. But he's, Canaan is not the descendant of the African peoples, and he's the one who is cursed. So the use of this text historically to justify slavery doesn't quite fit. I simply bring that up because if you decide to dig into this passage, you will see this passage used in that sort of way. No mas. <laughs> But returning to our text, you have the enslavement of Canaan. Secondly, you have the enrichment of Shem. Verse 26, he also said, Blessed be Yahweh, the God of Shem. Let Canaan be Shem's slave. And again, it's interesting. The word of blessing isn't spoken directly to Shem. It's spoken to Yahweh. Again, there's an interesting parallel with Genesis 3. Remember the promise of the deliverer that's made in Genesis chapter 3? It's not spoken to Adam or Eve. It's spoken to the serpent. But now you have a word of commendation for Shem, but it's not spoken to Shem. It's spoken to the God of Shem, Yahweh. God gets all the praise for his gracious work that will happen through Shem. As one commentator put it, only because of God's gracious and merciful favor towards Shem's progeny can they claim any blessing for themselves. For this reason, the church fathers as well as the reformers understood this blessing to be an extension of the promise to Eve. 
So now that line that's being drawn, the plan of redemption, okay, we, we now see a connection. Okay, Adam, it's going to come from one of Adam and Eve's descendants, obviously. Okay, now it's going to come through Shem's line. The text would seem to suggest that Shem had some sort of relationship with Yahweh, but even then, the, relation, the blessing here isn't mentioned because of Shem's righteousness. God blesses only because he is good and gracious and is faithful to himself. And as redemptive history plays out, these words come true. It is the Israelites who come from Shem who will ultimately dominate the Canaanite peoples. You have enslavement, you have enrichment. Thirdly, you have the enlargement of Japheth. The enlargement of Japheth, verse 27. Noah continues, let God extend Japheth. Let Japheth dwell in the tents of Shem. Let Canaan be Shem's slave. Now you've got a little play on words here. Japheth means the same, it's from the Hebrew word for extend. So a little play on words here. Japheth, as we'll see in Genesis chapter 10, is the father of the predominantly Gentile nations. And it's fascinating that Noah says that Japheth will dwell in the tents of Shem. That the blessing, the enlargement that he talks about, comes in the tents of Shem. Isn't it interesting that salvation comes from Shem's line? Spoiler alert, Jesus comes from Shem's line. And the Gentiles find eternal life in the house of a Jewish Messiah. Let me, let me say that again. You've got Shem's line. Through Shem's line, the Messiah comes. The Messiah comes bringing salvation, not just for the Jewish people, but for the Gentile peoples. The Gentiles find rest, they find blessing in the house of ultimately a Jewish Messiah. So you've got enslavement for Canaan, enrichment for Shem, and enlargement for Japheth. And with that, the story of Noah ends, verses 28 and 29. Now Noah lived 350 years after the flood. So Noah's life lasted 950 years, then he died. New world, same old character. New world, same old consequences. Thirdly, you have a new world, sovereignly ordered for Christ. A new world, sovereignly ordered for Christ, chapter 10. Chapter 10 is what's called the table of nations. Now, you'll be happy to know I'm not going to go verse by verse through the table of nations. But it's important. It's here for a reason. You know, I once heard somebody give a terrible advice. Oh, if you're reading through Genesis and you get to chapter 10, feel free to skip it. No, don't. <laughs> Chapter 9, verse 19, we heard that the earth is populated through the three sons of Noah. Well, here we read about that population. I believe in the study guide, there should be a map in there which shows you where these peoples landed. Almost 70 of them, nations, people groups. Structure is very simple. You've got Japheth's line in verses 2 through 5, Ham's line in verses 6 through 20, and then Shem's line through 21 to 31. Like I said, we're not going to look verse by verse through this section. I just want to note three observations from this chapter. First of all, God ordains nations. God ordains the nations. So again, you have 70 nations that are mentioned, 70 people groups mentioned in Genesis chapter 10. And a large number of them we will encounter again and again as we read the Old Testament. Now, some people will treat nations and their distinctives as though there are a problem to be solved. Let me get immediately practical for a moment. There are some people, I've encountered them a lot in my life, who think that the diversity we see in the world, they won't say this, but they just behave like it. As though the diversity that we see in creation, that's a problem to be overcome. What we need is not more diversity, we need more sameness. But can I put it to you that what we see in Genesis and chapter 10 is God ordaining a world in which humanity is well and truly diverse? And the New Testament helps us understand this too. Tell with me to Acts 17. Acts 17, 
Keep something here in Genesis 10. We'll be back here in a minute. But Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, Paul is preaching to the Athenians on Mars Hill. In Acts chapter 17, Paul makes a statement. He says it in passing, but I think it's worth noting. Acts chapter 17, verse 26, if you're there. Acts chapter 17, verse 26. He says, from one man, referring to God, from one man he, God, has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. Did you know that Paul goes out of his way to say that God made all nationalities? God makes the geographical boundaries of where they live. He appoints them to live where they live, when they live. Can I put it to you that if God wanted a monochromatic, monocultural world, he would have made the world to look that way? We'll have a message in a couple of weeks because I do want to touch on this issue of God, race, and the nations from a biblical perspective. So I'm not going to say too much now. But suffice it to say that God's plan for the nations was always diversity. Di- yes, diversity submitted to the will and the way of God, but God's design was never uniformity. That's why when you read the New Testament, you look at the church, there's little discussion of a culture that is imposed on the church, and a lot of talk of unity despite our differences. Why? God is not trying to eradicate differences. He's trying to maintain them in his will and in his way. More on that in a couple of weeks when we look at God raising the nations. But for now, just know that we can't talk about God's plan of redemption without recognizing a redeemed and diverse humanity being a part of that plan. So that's the first observation we learn from this text. But the second one, is that the kingdom of God will oppose, the, king, the kingdom of man, excuse me, will oppose the kingdom of God. should be a typo up there. The kingdom of man will oppose the kingdom of God, verses 8 through 11. As we have this listing of names, the narrative kind of slows down for a second, and we're introduced to this character called Nimrod. Nimrod, literally the rebel. In fact, that's what the term Nimrod means, means to rebel. He's the rebel. And that's a clue all in itself that this man we're talking about is not a good guy. He's referred to in the text as a hunter in the presence of the Lord. And I'll be honest, it really wasn't until I was working till last night to finish this message. It wasn't until late last night that I finally understood what this reference meant. Well, at least I think I do. Remember back when we were in chapter 9, the early part of chapter 9. And God introduces meat into man's diet. Remember that God is kind of careful in saying that, yes, he's introducing meat to man's diet, but that doesn't give man a carte blanche to willfully mistreat animal life. Back in Genesis 9, did we see a command allowing for wanton hunting? Now, I know I'm in southern Oregon, so I should tread very carefully here. This is not a moral statement about the goodness or badness of hunting. It's not. I think it's mentioned in relation to Nimrod because Nimrod is practicing this act in a way that blatantly disregards God's command regarding the treatment of the animal world. Add to that that when you've read Genesis up to this point, violence when it comes up in Genesis is not a good thing. We've already had one man you know, kill his brother, another man kind of basically rap about the fact that he killed another guy for no apparent reason. Violence is not a good thing when it comes up in Genesis. And here it is being attached to Nimrod. But I'll put it to you that that's by the by, that's not the main reason he's mentioned here. Did you catch, if if you've been reading Genesis chapter 10, let's look at it real quick. Genesis chapter 10, let me show you something there. Genesis chapter 10. I believe... If I can get to it real quick. Genesis chapter 10, verse 10. Notice that it says that his kingdom started with Babylon, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Nimrod is said to rule over a kingdom. Why is that important? 
the only time we have seen kingdom language in Genesis up to this point has been Genesis chapter 1. Remember 26 to 28? If you're the marking type, you might want to highlight that in Genesis. I was arguing it's a key verse in the book. Let us make man in our image and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the earth and of all the creeping things that creep on the earth. The language of kingdom, of rule and dominion is mentioned by God in chapter 1. And now we've got a man who is ruling and reigning by himself outside of God's provision. Nimrod really becomes the first person in all the Bible, and we'll see multiple people like Nimrod all through the Bible, who sets up a kingdom in his name, not a kingdom in God's name. In Nimrod, we see what Psalm 2 puts in song, Psalm 2 verses 1 through 3. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and their rulers conspire against Yahweh and his anointed one. Let us throw off their chains and let us throw their ropes off of us. Now, in our next study, we're going to see how, I would argue, Nimrod and the kingdom around him seeks to set up their kingdom against God and what God does in response. But for now, you start to see the fact that, hmm, God's kingdom plan is not unopposed in this world. Then not only is man sinful, but sinful men will set up rival kingdoms to God's kingdom. So God ordains nation, or na nations, excuse me. The kingdom of man will oppose the kingdom of God. Thirdly, God's Messiah is still coming. Despite all that, God's Messiah is still coming, verses 21 to 31. We see Shem's line in 21 to 31. And from Shem would come a man named Terah. From Terah would come a man named Abraham. From Abraham would come the nation of Israel. From the nation of Israel would come the Messiah himself. Yes, we've had a new fall, courtesy of the new Adam, with new curses, and now even a rival kingdom. But here's the good news in more ways than one. The Messiah is still on schedule. The original audience might not have known his name, but we know his name. Because the New Testament will come along, Luke chapter 3, and will point out that Jesus is the son of Shem. That through Shem comes the Messiah through whom salvation comes to all of humanity. Because one of Shem's descendants will be God with us. He will enter into creation, take on human flesh. He will live the life that we could not live. He will die the death that we rightly deserved. And through him, salvation comes to all the nations. And so, yes, we've had a fall, we've had curses, we've had sinfulness on display, and yet, God's plan remains undeterred. We'll see more about God's plan for the nations in our next study in Genesis chapter 11, but for now, let's pray together. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you that your plan for the nations is still, has been fulfilled and is being fulfilled through your Son and our Savior, Jesus. We thank you that even in the midst of fallenness and wickedness, your plan cannot and will not be thwarted. Father, we thank you that we know who Shem's greater son was, our Lord Jesus. Thank you that we have come to know him, that we have found salvation in him, that we who were Gentiles have found rest in his house. Jesus being the temple, the dwelling of God with men. Father, help us that we would love him more, love him deeply, that we would share him with those who don't know him. And above all, our very lives would seek to glorify him in everything we do. We ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, we come to the Lord's table, and as we come to the Lord's table, um, Doug, if